In this lecture, we discuss the second Marian dogma that was chronologically proclaimed. This is the dogma of Mary's threefold virginity, that Mary was virginal in the first context, before the birth of Jesus, secondly, during the birth of Jesus, and thirdly, after the birth of Jesus. Now, this dogma was initially proclaimed by Pope Martin I, in 649 at the Lateran Council. Now, the Lateran Council was not an ecumenical council, but the proceedings regarding Our Lady from the Lateran Council were confirmed at Second Constantinople in 681, which was indeed an ecumenical council. That's why we rightfully refer to Mary's threefold virginity doctrine as a dogma. Now, we, my friends, are in an age where virginity is not much appreciated. And before we get into these three aspects of her virginity, I want to start with the concept, uh, the Christian understanding, that virginity in no sense says no to the value of the body, to use an expression of St. John Paul II. Nor does it devalue or demean sexuality. Virginity is to... Take the gift of body that God has given certain individuals, or in fact all human beings, but the individuals making the virginal vow, and the individual is giving that gift back to God. So it's not a negation of the gift. It's not a devaluing of the gift. It's valuing the gift, the gift of the body, the gift of sexuality, and because it is valued, it's given back to God in an act of discipleship. It is also appropriately done because this is the perfect example of following the Savior. Jesus Christ also lived the virginal life. And so Mary, as Jesus' greatest disciple, is also going to live this life in giving the value of her body back to God directly. Uh, one thing, my friends, that we're simply going to have to grant. When you have one woman who is to be the perfect example of virginity, and at the same time, the perfect example of motherhood, you have to expect exceptions. And we're going to see precisely, for example, in Mary's virginity during the birth of Jesus, how God would supernaturally protect even Mary's physical virginity so that her, her body would reflect her soul that Mary's physical virginity would be intact to, as the fathers of the church say, pr uh, remaining intact as a concrete sign of her perfect interior virginity. So, let's go through Mary's threefold virginity. Once again, the dogma, as proclaimed by Pope Martin I, establishes these three dimensions. Mary's virginity before the birth of Jesus, Mary's virginity during the birth of Jesus, Mary's virginity after the birth of Jesus. So let's go through those three dimensions uh, as they are found in the sources of Revelation. So we begin with Mary's virginity before the birth. We have in the Apostles' Creed uh, the line that Jesus was, quote, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, which tells us that Jesus is A, conceived by God, and B, born of a virgin. We have as well in the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14, uh, which we went over in a brief fashion in our survey, quote, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel. As we previously mentioned in an earlier lecture, in the Greek, the word is parthenos. P-A-R-T-H-E-N-O-S, Parthenos, which only can mean virgin. And remember the context of this prophecy of Isaiah to Ahaz, uh, the dubious king who is seeking uh, political solutions instead of uh, trusting in the covenant and the heavenly father. And so Isaiah gives Ahaz a sign Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you, you shall call him Emmanuel, the God with us. There's not too much of a sign value if a young married woman 
conceives and bears a son. That happens every day. It has a sign value and a prophetic sign value and a supernatural sign value if indeed a virgin, a parthenos, does this. Now, in the Hebrew Alma, there is clearly uh, the first meaning, meaning a young woman. It is typically a woman of meritable, meritable age. Uh, it is almost always in context of virgin. And in light of the context, it is clearly virgin, especially when we have the New Testament confirming. The Holy Spirit is our exegete there, confirming that Mary giving birth to Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah. So we have all legitimate reasons for understanding that the prophecy of Isaiah is a prophecy referring to a virgin conceiving and bearing. Now notice in the prophecy, there's two verbs. A virgin will A, conceive, and B, bear a child, a son. The fathers of the church will acknowledge and, and take notice of both of those verbs as we talk about Mary's virginal conceiving of Jesus, but also the second dimension of her virginity, Mary's virginal bearing of Jesus. More on that in a few moments. Now we go to the dialogue between the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin of Nazareth. Luke uh, 1, it's 26, following all the way through 38, the fiat and, and ongoing. But Gabriel says, quote, You shall conceive and bear a son. Mary responds, How will this be since I know not man? Now, in the New Vulgate, it's que modo fiat istud. How will this be? It's a future tense, which is significant in that Mary's not doubting that this is to take place. She's asking a legitimate question of instrumentality. How will it take place? Mary's a thinking being, but she's an obedient being. And so her question in no sense implies doubt. Uh, that incidentally is contrasted with the response of Zechariah. And that's why a, you know, a cursory reading of the two dialogues between Gabriel and Mary and Gabriel and uh, Zechariah might appear in some translations to seem almost parallel. Uh, Mary and, and Zachariah essentially say the same thing, and one becomes the mother of God and the co-redemptor to the human race, the other one becomes mute. Uh, they're not parallel responses. Even in the New Vulgate, Zachariah says to Gabriel's announcement uh, regarding uh, the bearing of John the Baptist by his wife, he says literally, unde hoc, uh, which in Latin means according to who? So it's filled with doubt and even questioning the authority of Gabriel. And Gabriel responds, Ego Gabriel, I am Gabriel, and you will be mute. So it's a, it's a substantially different response. Mary's response, how will this be? Now, in context of virginity, she says, I know not man. Which is the biblical way of saying she not only has not had marital relations, but as Laurentin and many other uh, renowned Mariologists have commented, it refers to a permanent condition. Now, Laurentin is a more recent confirmer of what the Fathers of the Church tell us in this statement. We'll talk more about this with her perpetual virginity. That in this statement, I know not man, Mary is saying not only, I have not, not only that I have not yet known man, but as a permanent disposition. Uh, as one author says, it's like saying, if someone offers you a cigarette, well, no, thank you, I don't smoke. Well, the I don't smoke doesn't simply mean I don't want to smoke now. It also implies as a permanent condition, as a habit, I don't smoke. And that was Mary's response. I know not man. And this led the fathers of the church to conclude to Mary's vow of virginity that she had before she is betrothed to Joseph. Much more on that later. So, both in terms of explicit reference and also in context, Mary is virginal before the birth of Jesus. The early fathers of the church are unanimous on this. We have St. Ignatius of Antioch, who dies in 107, St. Justin Martyr, who dies in 165, St. Irenaeus, who dies in 202, St. Clement, Saint Clement of Alexandria, etc. As this continues onward, dies in 211, this is not a debated issue. Uh, of course, 
Mary's virginity, like, like all the truth about Our Lady, it always redounds on the question about Jesus. If, if Mary's not virginal, who exactly is Jesus? Well, he's not going to be the Word made flesh uh, if, indeed, he is from human seed, uh, at least in terms of any un understandable context of incarnation in the Christian revelation. So, virginity before the birth. Let's go to part two now. Virginity during the birth. This is fascinating. It's beautiful. It's sublime. Sadly, it's very rarely referred to in teaching or preaching. It still is not only the tradition of the church, but it's an essential part of this second Marian dogma. The virginity during the birth establishes that Jesus left the womb of Mary without any opening of the womb, that is, in a miraculous manner, in a way that protected Mary's physical virginity. The fathers of the church uh, used the, the image of light passing through glass, that light passes through glass without harming the glass. So, too, Jesus passes through the womb of Mary without any physical violation to Mary's physical virginal integrity. This is called the virginitas intactu uh, by the fathers. Now, first we're going to establish that this is indeed part of Christian revelation, and secondly, we're going to ask the question, why? Why would God use a miracle just to protect Mary's physical virginity? And keep in mind here, and, and I say this with all due respect, this is an essential part of the dogma, her virginity during the birth. If it doesn't mean Mary's mirac uh, Jesus' uh, miraculous uh, exit from the womb of Mary, if it doesn't mean what the fathers of the church say, if it doesn't mean what the Pope says, we'll see, says from Leo the, uh, Leo the Great to even uh, Pius the Twelfth, what else could it mean? Did Pope Martin really think that someone might think that Mary was going to have relations while she's giving birth? This is not only absurd, it's, it's bordering on the disrespectful. Uh, so there's a meaning for this aspect of the definition. Mary's virginity during the birth. The fathers of the church, as confirmed by uh, papal comments, make clear that we're talking about the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, the, the, the miracle by which Mary's physical virginity is protected. Let's go through the sources on this. Now, some of the fathers of the church will go back to the Isaiah 7.14 quote, uh, that a virgin will conceive, okay, that referring to Mary's first dimension of virginity. Secondly, a virgin will bear, and this would be, a reference to this second dimension of Mary's virginity, her physical uh, her bearing of Jesus uh, in a miraculous manner, as a virgin. Uh, we have fathers, uh, including St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, uh, and many others, uh, as, a, as the vast majority of fathers uh, defend Mary's uh, miraculous birth of Jesus, the Tome of Leo is particularly uh, powerful and sublime here. Uh, in, Leo's, in Pope St. Leo's famous Tome to Flavian, he says, quote, Mary brought him forth with her virginity intact, as with her virginity intact she conceived him. So see the parallel between the first dimension of Mary's virginity and the second dimension. They're both virginal, and with Mary's virginity intact. Now, Saint later, St. Thomas Aquinas will quote St. Augustine in defending the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. This is the Summa Theologica, or the Theologiae, uh, Teres, question 28, the third part, question 28, article 2, where St. Augustine, excuse me, where St. Thomas Aquinas quotes St. Augustine in support of this miracle, uh, the, the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, where Thomas says, Christ was born by divine power without physical violation of 
her integrity. Painlessly and without change in Mary's body, Christ emerged from the tabernacle of her spotless womb as she was later as he was later to emerge from Pilate's tomb. So, Augustine, Aquinas, reflecting the tradition, uh, again, confirmed by Leo in the tome. This was a miracle. Now, we'll talk here briefly about the issue of painless uh, birth, which is uh, at least a first cousin issue to this issue of Mary's miraculous birth. The Council, the Catechism of the Council of Trent makes clear that Mary gave birth to Jesus in a painless fashion. Why? Because Mary was the Immaculate One. Mary would not suffer the effects of sin. One of the effects of sin and original sin and its effects is indeed that a woman would give birth in pain. Mary would be free from that. So, it's the possibility of giving birth uh, to Jesus, even with the, you know, the, the exercising of a muscle. It, it, it didn't necessitate pain in original man and woman. That's a result of sin, and therefore Mary could not experience pain in labor. Again, uh, some might be quick to jump to the conclusion well, that, but that's not very natural. Well, here we have to define our terms, my friends, because are we talking about fallen natural, what we're used to, or is it more appropriate when we're talking about Our Lady to talk about original natural, how Adam and Eve had it before the fall, Jesus' immaculate humanity, and Mary's immaculate humanity, because that's God the Father's plan A. That's what he wanted for us from the beginning. Plan B is the fall, and therefore we have a fallen natural experience of giving birth. But remember, we don't want to uh, force upon Mary that which is natural for fallen natural beings like ourselves. The Immaculate One deserves to have the painless labor and also to have a labor free from the violation of her physical integrity. Now, uh, we also have, for example, Lumen Gentium 57. Uh, they used the liturgical formulation, and I quote, and this is also contained in the Catechism, in, cat, in, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church number 499. Uh, the quote, The birth of our Lord, who did not diminish his mother's virginal integrity, but sanctify it. Okay, did not diminish his mother's virginal integrity through his birth, but sanctify it. This goes back to the concept of St. Augustine. He came to liberate and sanctify, not to corrupt and violate. Now, we also have Saint, excuse me, uh, Pope Pius XII's statement in 1943 with Missi de Corpus, where he talks about the, quote, miraculous birth of the Lord. So, it's clear, it's in the tradition, it's part of the dogma. What about the why question? Why would God put so much effort to preserve Mary's physical virginity? Here we can benefit from the great contribution of, of uh, St. John Paul II's theology of the body. And one of the fundamental principles of St. John Paul II's theology of the body is that the body expresses the person. The exterior expresses the interior. Now, let's see how that truth re refers and relates to our question here. Excuse me. So, if the body expresses the person, then Mary's physical virginity would be an expression of her perfect interior virginity. Incidentally, if we have the case... In, 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 the, in the grotesque and, and the violent and abhorrent situation of, of rape, and let's say a, a woman who is a virgin is raped, well, her physical virginity has been taken away, but her interior virginity is completely untouched because it was an act of violence, not of volition. But if you're going to have one woman be the exemplar of all virgins, and she's going to be virginal both interior and exterior. And that's the why. That's why uh, the Mary is going to be the perfect virgin because she's also the perfect disciple. And part of being the perfect disciple uh, includes this 
gift of body back to God as Jesus did. So, that is the virginity before the birth, and secondly, during the birth. Let's now go to the third aspect of her virginity, that is Mary's virginity after the birth. And here, we're going to take a lecture break because I want to deal with the major objections to Our Lady's perpetual virginity, along with the positive teaching of why the Church, even from the 4th century, in what could be considered a statement of the papal magisterium, clearly and explicitly defended that Mary was the perfect and the the perpetual virgin for the rest of her life. Thank you.